The Fairfield Forum is a student-centered speaking program hosted by the Forum team at Fairfield Middle School. Each month, the Forum will present community leaders from a variety of backgrounds to speak to our student body. The theme of our talks for our inaugural season is excellent. Today's program author is a combination of tremendous work and support from the Fairfield and Heriko community. As always, we would like to thank those who have helped make this forum possible. We would like to first thank and welcome Fairfield, a representative from the Henrico County School Board in attendance today, Mrs. Christy B. Kinsella. <laughs> welcome, Ms. Kinsella. It is an honor to have you with us today. We also welcome our guests from Henrico County Public Schools Central Office, the Henrico Police Soil and Water Conservation Board, and our guests from the Richmond Forum. <laughs> we would like to thank our principal, Dr. Gibson, and the entire Fairfield Administrative Cabinet for their support of the Fair Forum. Our community sponsors, Lowe's of East Richmond, Smart Mouth and the Richmond Forum, whose support is proof that learning at Fairfield is truly community supported. Finally, a tremendous thank you is also in order to the teachers and students of Fairfield who are joining us here today, as well as the 32 student leaders who make up our forum team. Please give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> now to our speaker, Mr. Andy Jink serves as the official spokesperson for Henrico County Public Schools and as Chief of Communications and Community Engagement. These departments and specialists devoted to news media relations, family and community engagement, inter internal and external communications, television services and video production, website print pr production and graphic design, special event planning, PTA and legislative affairs, freedom, of Information Act. Before joining Henrico Schools in 2012, Mr. Jinks was a television show's anchor and reporter at NBC, NBC 12 in Richmond. He is, in a, he is a graduate of Syracuse University, SI New House School of, for Public Communication. When we begin our program, we may recognize Mr. Jinks' voice as the official spokesperson for Henrico County Public Schools. It is Mr. Jinks who we hear over our phones on those snowy mornings or the night before those snowy mornings. Relying the message to us whether or not school is in Henrico will be closed. The suspense of these calls and the playful tweets that usually precede them have endeared Mr. Jinx to the students of Henrico County Public Schools since he arrived. Our parents aren't too thrilled by them though. These snow messages are far from Mr. Jinx. Most important updates, however, as well we soon hear. Our program will begin with Mr. Jinx speaking, speaking to our moderator, Mr. Lapers, followed by a student-led question and answer. So at this time, please give a warm welcome to the sixth ever Fairfield Forum speaker, Mr. Andrew Jinx. Thank you very much. Welcome. Hey, right, good to be here. Yeah. How How's everybody? Going? Morning, everyone. All right. Are we on? Yes. We're um, on. Well. Mr. Jenks, welcome back. Oh, uh, good to be here. I believe you were here about a month ago. That's right. And probably been here a few times before. And I've studied the tape of Dr. Cashwell's appearance, so I, I hope I live up to those high expectations. Excellent. You got some intel. That's right. Um, there's two two things that people said when they learned that you were coming to speak at this forum, students and teachers both. And one of them was, have you ever seen him? He's like really, really tall. And uh, so my first question for you is, can you dunk? I cannot dunk. The best I've ever been able to do is just get a little bit of my fingers on the tip of the rim. So I, I've never been a tremendous basketball player. I can touch the rim, cannot throw one down. I wish I could. Okay. Well, if you, I mean, if you practice uh, next year, you're welcome to come back and show us. No amount of practice is going to help me dunk a basketball. Okay. It's not going to happen. We understand. We understand. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so uh, this is how our forum goes for anybody who hasn't been here yet. We've got about 15 minutes of questions that I'll have for Mr. Jenks or to get to know you and to know your process. Um, and then we've got about 11 students who have questions for you, our VIP students, um, who have done some research into you and they have some questions, okay? I'm afraid of what you all might have found on the internet oh. about me, so, yeah. all right, we'll get to that. Okay, you ready to start? Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. So, um, 
At the Fairfield Forum, we like to spotlight for each of our different speakers uh, an Henrico Learner Profile characteristic. And for those of you unfamiliar, the Henrico Learner Profile, it's got six C's that make a life-ready learner. And so the spotlighted C that we have for you, sort of obvious, communicator. But what we want to ask is, did we peg you right? Would you identify most as a communicator? Or is it, is it time to dispel some myths about Mr. Jenks? There's actually some other things that, uh, that you... Yeah, um, communication is clearly what we do. But I, I think many of the six C's go into being an effective communicator. And the, one of the ones that comes immediately to mind is collaboration or being a collaborator. Because I think doing communication effectively right off the bat means you have to acknowledge that it's not just a one-way street. You need at least more than one person, not only to put information out effectively, but in order to reach people the proper ways, it's, it's kind of a two-way street. By that, I mean you do as much talking as you do listening. So if I'm sharing information, effective communication also relies on me listening carefully to what you're telling me back, whether it's further questions or uh, not quite understanding what I'm saying, either either by verbal or nonverbal cues. And so in that sense, I think that we're collaborating to understand one another, but you also, I think, collaborate effectively in producing information in the first place. In other words, it's not just about everything I know. It's about what our organization is trying to share with the public and working together in order to do that the most effectively. Okay. There was actually some uh, communication stuff going on even before this uh, before this forum began, right? Because uh, I believe you had to send some messages about your possible weather. One of my primary responsibilities back at the office is kind of to, to be the first phone call if something unusual is happening at any of our schools. And we have 72 schools uh, in Henrico County. And y'all probably noticed that it's awfully windy outside right now. And so four or five of our schools don't have power at the moment. And so their job is to kind of call me and report that. And as this situation escalates, we might have some decisions to make about how classes take place or what we need to tell parents. And at least for the next hour and a half, they're on their own. So uh, I had to put a little message on my phone that says, call a different number because I've got the Fairfield Forum this morning. I think they're gonna be okay. Oftentimes power outages with schools at least can be restored fairly quickly, but this might be a unique circumstance where there's just so many happening at one moment in time that it might be a little more substantial effort. So I'll find out more about that when we're through here today, but believe me, I'm 100% focused on what we're talking about now. Well, thank you. And I think we actually have a question from one of our students sort of about that decision-making process. Um, okay, so the theme of our forum for this inaugural season is audience, someone said it. Excellence, yeah, excellence. So when Dr. Cashwell came to our very first forum and we asked her what excellence meant to her, she said that excellence is a mindset that you can take with you and apply to any job, no matter how visible or a job that uh, people may not notice. And then in our second forum, Mr. Montgomery talked about how excellence is um, taking that mindset and helping the people on your left and your right so that you can be counted on. So my question for you is this, do you agree with, with that about excellence? Do you have anything to add? And then maybe, could you tell us about the people who worked with you at MBC 12, or the people who work with you now in Henrico County Public Schools who you don't see their face on the camera, you don't hear their voice on the phone, but their path of excellence helps you in your job? Uh, first of all, if I know what's good for me, yes, I'm going to agree with a former school board member and the superintendent's interpretation of what excellence is. So ver I very much uh, agree with that, of course. Um, but excellence, um, in terms of what, what the public sees or what a school community sees, is never the result of any one person. So I think you hit that nail perfectly on the head that there are, in any situation, local news, a school system, or, or any sort of organization, big or small, relies on a large number of people who you don't see. And sure, there might be one guy or a group of people who appear to be completely and totally responsible for something, but I would assure you that that is almost never the case. And I have a good day because 15 other people are having a good day at the same time. And when everyone's clicking on all cylinders, that's when I think we have our best results. And it's never, ever the result of just one person doing a really good job. There are unsung heroes or folks who just don't necessarily have an appetite for a spotlight or for public attention, but you need those folks to be as good as they can be at their job so we can do as well as 
we want to be in, in our job. So the point is, is that a, a team effort exists, in, at least in my experience, in, in all walks of life. And being excellent doesn't just mean walking into a room and, and doing your best. It means helping the others on your team do their best as well. So collectively, we're all doing the kind of work that we want to do. Okay, wonderful. Um, would you say that being uh, or being excellent or being a leader is something you're born to do, or something that you choose to do? You know, it probably goes both ways. I don't. I don't feel like I was born as a, as a leader or anything. I, I think for me, it it is a required skill. One, frankly, that I, I think I'm still learning and will continue to be learning. So I, I don't feel like I walk around thinking I am a leader. I, I've never adopted that mindset. I think I'm. Um, always watching other people and trying to learn from those who have been there or done that or just are, are better at it than, than me or, or just in general folks I look up to. And so I, I think, at least for me, that's it's an acquired skill. It's something that develops over time by listening to other people and, and absorbing experiences from those who have been good at it before and, and, and being mindful of the sense that I, I don't think I'll ever have it quite figured out. And so it's important to be open-minded to the viewpoint and the experiences of others that will help you yourself be a better person or a better leader or be better at whatever it is that you really want to do. Is there anybody who you've ever met or maybe people who you uh, looked up to or watched who you thought um, exuded excellence in a way, just like a, a, a hero for you or a sort of North Star for you? Yeah, I, um, I think a couple things come to mind. When I was younger and, and um, you know, middle school age or, or high school age, I, I was really into the network television news where this was, you know, seemingly a hundred years ago where the internet wasn't fully formed yet and, and if you wanted to watch the news or see what was going on in the world, there were a few ways to do it. It wasn't the stone ages or anything, but you watch TV at six o'clock in the evening or you got a newspaper first thing in the morning. And so network news anchors were really impressionable to me. These are guys like, uh, for the older folks in the room, uh, you know, Tom Brokaw, Peter Jennings, Dan Rather, that kind of thing. That made an impression on me because these were people who, to me, came off like the smartest, most knowledgeable people on the face of the earth. But going back to what we discussed just a few moments ago, it's not like they just inherently knew all of the information that was going on in the world. That's the result of a global network of reporters and producers and news writers who come together for a common goal. But that made a really good impression on me because these, these people, these network news anchors, um, were able to put, um, I guess, a, a public face on a just vast and incredibly nuanced effort that was excellent to me. And so at, at the age that I think many in our audience are now, that made a good impression on me and, and I think paved the way for a, a career that began in local news 20 years ago. Um, okay, speaking of going back in time, we're going to take you back to middle school in a second. Okay. But um, show of hands from our audience, how many of you guys are in the sixth grade? Just so you can raise your hand. Okay, pretty cool. All right, hands down. Uh, seventh graders, any seventh graders? Looks like maybe two or three classes. Okay. And eighth grade. Ooh, that's all right. It's pretty even spread. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, so, Mr. Jenks, we're going to take you back to middle school. Okay. Where was this? Was this New York? So, this was New York State, and where I grew up, it was actually called junior high. Okay. Junior high was grades uh, 7, 8, and 9. Okay. And then high school was 10, 11, and 12. So, but yeah, so this was in New York State. Okay. Um, so, my question is, would, uh, so little Mr. Andy Jenks running around with his friends, 6, 7, 8, 9, ninth grade, do you think that your classmates then would look at you now, the person you've become, NBC 12 reporter and anchor, communications chief, major school division. Do you think that they would look at you now and say, that's the Andy Jenks that we know, that's the Andy Jenks that we remember, that sounds right? I think they would look at Virginia and see how bonkers we get when there are two inches of snow and they would not be able to make any sense out of it at all. Because keep in mind, I grew up in New York State where it takes two feet of snow to shut everything down so my first impression is that they would look at what happens here in Central Virginia and they wouldn't believe it. Like, this guy's well known for closing school because of two inches of snow on the ground. They, it wouldn't compute. It wouldn't be a thing that would make any sense. Um, the news anchor component of my, you know, 
first career might make a little more sense, because I, I think I was into that at, at age 13, 14, and 15, something like that. Um, but I think the school closing thing would blow their mind. Yeah. It just, it, it wouldn't, they wouldn't get it. Where, did you do like public speaking when, when yeah. you were that young? Like, is that where they would get the impression from? Yeah, I think so. And not a lot of it, but, uh, you know, we had a group that would do the morning announcements like you have here at school. And there wasn't a lot of video going on in schools, at least not the one um, where I grew up. And this was, you know, 25 years ago. So um, some aspects of it would certainly make sense. By the time we all got to college, I think it, it takes greater shape. But in middle school, maybe I didn't quite have it all figured out yet. Um, but there, there were probably some aspects that would that would make sense all these years later. Okay. Um, so then, as you grew up, uh, I was wondering if there has ever been, or if there ever was, a pivotal moment for you, and that can be just that a moment, or a relationship, <clears throat> or an event that you witnessed that had this thing not happened, you very well could have not chosen the career you chose, or the path of excellence that you so yeah. obviously chose. I can't put my finger on any one particular event, but I do remember a feeling of, of when I was middle school or, or junior high age, which goes back to the idea of, you know, news was built around a certain time of day that you kind of stopped what you're doing and, and watched, or at least it was on in the background while you were having dinner or something like that. And I was really um, interested and intrigued by the idea that there was something that, at least in my house, could capture the household's attention for a half hour at a time. And that meaning the, the six o'clock news or a newspaper that my mom or dad might read in the beginning of the day, and, and I would too. And so, again, try to wrap your head around the idea that nobody had a cell phone, nobody had instant news at their fingertips. There really, is, my recollection is there's no other way to know than to physically turn on a television at a certain time of day and, and you would find out what was going on. I think. A few years into college is when 24-hour cable news started to come into existence. So this is a world where, again, not, not the Stone Ages, I'm not 100 years old, but really news was not as in your face and 24-7 as it has been for quite some time now. And I was really intrigued by the idea that somebody in a box on a television could command the household attention for a short period of time. And I really wanted to be one of those people, whether it was a news anchor or a reporter who was on the front lines of something important that was happening in a community. Many experiences, I think, made an impression on me. And it was just day to day or week to week, the ability to capture a family's attention really made an impression on me. Another good aspect, I think, um, was the idea of, uh, I'll you know, focus on snow closings again. Here, you can get a text or, or see something on, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and, and know right away. Um, when I grew up, you kind of had to listen to the radio. Please tell me this audience knows what a radio still is, right? Yes? Okay, thank you. You had to listen to a guy read a long alphabetized list of schools that were closed. My school, I grew up in Rome, New York. Not Rome, Italy, but Rome, New York. And the R's take an excruciatingly long time to get to when you're trying to find out if you are going to school or not. And that is another example of somebody just really capturing your attention. And again, I'm you know 14 years old, so I've got nothing else to do. And that was just a really fascinating experience for me. I wanted to be one of these guys who had information to share that would allow everyone to kind of stop what they were doing and listen for just a short period of time. Now, of course, I mean, you, you can get it instantly. You don't have to wait for anything. But back in that time, that, that, those experiences were, made a really positive impression on me. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a, like a particular news story um, that you you remember being reported? I'm thinking of things like the Challenger. That's um, like was honestly there... that was the first one that came to mind. Yeah, yeah. that 1986, um, the cover of Newsweek magazine. Um, again, I'm not 1986. I'm at an age where I'm not tuned into things that are happening. You get a magazine one day and you see the image of an exploded space shuttle, and, and I all these years later I haven't forgotten that. That is probably the news event that I remember the, the most vividly. I probably couldn't explain details of it now, but to this day, I still remember the cover of that magazine like in my house, and, yeah. and that, that made an impression on me. Yeah. I don't know that it made me want to go into a career in news broadcasting, right. but the news or what was in it, that is certainly a, one that stuck with me. Yeah, okay. One, <clears throat> one final question before we turn uh, the students on you. I was, uh, when... <laughs> One thing that occurs to me when you're somebody who does choose excellence, 
as a path for whatever job you take is you're also choosing the unknown because by putting yourself out there to be excellent, you're also putting yourself out there for judgment. So sure. um, for eighth graders who are applying to specialty centers, that's the path of excellence, but you could get rejected. Sure. For our athletes who are making videos of like their highlights, um, you know, to send off to colleges, that's the path of excellence to go to college and be a division one athlete, yeah. but you could be ignored. So they, you have this unknown when you aim this high. So is it worth it? Uh, in your opinion, is it worth it to, to choose excellence even though there is this, this possibility? Well, of course it's worth it, but like with anything, there are risks. The risk of being rejected or not getting your first choice, but the, the, the rewards, the highs, the, the joys of achieving excellence far outweigh the opposite. And frankly, sometimes it's the negative experiences that make the joys worth it. Imagine if you were excellent all the time. Imagine if you never messed anything up. If you were just perfect in every possible way, you'd start to remember what it feels like to be perfect, right? Because in my opinion, I think you only know when you achieve excellence because you've been on the other side before. You've screwed something up or you've not done as good a job as you've wanted to do. And it's those experiences. In other words, losing makes winning that much more euphoric and enjoyable because you know what it's like to be on the other side and it helps you work harder to achieve the goal that you want to achieve and, and and frankly I don't think excellence is ever something you achieve once and then you're done like all right I I got I was excellent I got an A plus on my test in eighth grade and I am finished the rest of life is just perfect from here on out I think excellence goes away really fast too it takes a long time to get it and then you your goals change and you aspire to do different things and in a lot of ways you're starting over again and even if you get to a certain place that feels really good and you think you've got it all figured out, my experiences are that it can change in a hurry. We do one great snow closing announcement six years ago, but that doesn't mean anything if you're a parent this year, right? And so messing up a communication now, it might not undo a lot of goodwill that our organization has built up over the years, but positive experiences from seven or eight years ago don't mean a whole lot to today's parents and today's families. And so I think excellence is always something that you're, you're striving for, and it's sometimes the experiences that might be less than excellent that make your best days all the much more enjoyable. Okay, I gotta ask, has there ever been something that happened on live TV that like, you're like, oh boy, I can't believe you just said that, or I can't believe that happened in the background? And it, that happens way more frequently than I think anyone would truly ever know. And so if you're really good at what you do in broadcasting or in teaching or in any walk of life, it's your ability to handle the mistakes or the issues behind the scenes that most people wouldn't know unless you just decided to draw attention to them. And sometimes I think just rolling with the punches, as, so to speak, or, or to adapt and adjust and to problem solve in such a way that your audience really has no idea that something unplanned was going on behind the scenes, that's a sign of someone who's really good at what they do. It's not just the ability to deliver a script without coughing or tripping over the word, it's, it's to make it seem like everything that's happening right before your eyes is perfectly normal. And the people who are the best at what they do in local news or in a hospital or a police station or in a classroom, are the ones who never let you think that something wrong is happening because they're able, they're prepared, they know how, they know what plan B, C, D, and E is, and they never let you know that they've had to do something that wasn't part of the original plan. That happens so often in broadcasting. The ones who are not good at what they do are the ones who draw so much attention to it and are fumbling with their scripts or just completely go silent. The, the trick is that you'll never know when something goes wrong and you'll never be able to really tell when the best people at it are solving problems on live TV because they're just so good at it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that will uh, end my session with you. We're going to turn down to the uh, to the students for some questions. We've got about 11 down here. All right. Uh, Mr. Ford is walking up. He's our micro. How about a round of applause for our microphone usher, Mr. Hunter Ford? Mr. Ford, are we on? Testing. All right. Wonderful. All right, hi, my name is Kennedy George, and my question is, what made you decide to start having fun with announcing important news? So the question, what made us wanted to start having fun with announcing important things? I don't know that there was ever a conscious decision. I think it was just an extension of, of, of 
personality a few years ago where, um, and this is now going back probably six or seven years. So six or seven years, y'all were first grade? This is a long time ago now, wasn't it? But I have used social media, which is really good, which are really good tools for sharing one's personality. I'd use that in local news. So in my previous career, I used it a lot. It was encouraged. Um, ended up switching over to the school system all those years later. And at the time, it wasn't something that was commonly used. And, and I think the st strategy or the thinking behind it was simply, why not? Let's have a little bit of fun with this. It's clearly something people are interested in and talking about. And so we have these tools at our disposal that would be really good for having an ongoing discussion about what the school system is thinking or when we might be able to announce something or just to have um, some, some funny banter with the, the people out there in our community. That seemed like a really enjoyable thing and a good idea at the time. I do remember that I was like taking questions from students at the time. Again, this is six, seven years ago. And I remember getting a, an email from someone I knew at local news at one of the TV stations. And they're like, Andy, I think your Twitter account's been hacked. And I'm like, what do you mean it's been hacked? Like, yeah, somebody's like making jokes on the Twitter account. I'm like, oh no, that, that's just me. Everything's fine. I'm like, that, that was a new thing to this particular TV station. Now it's fairly common, not just here, but elsewhere. And I don't want to take credit for like inventing jokes on the internet. I don't think I did that. But at least in this area, it was relatively uncommon to show personality in such a way because we're this big bureaucracy, we're a school system, we don't make jokes, we're, we're very serious people. I, I think it was a chance, and social media allowed us to do this, to, to let people know that at the end of the day, we're all just humans behind the keyboard, and if it's all right with the community, we'll, we'll try to have some fun. I think you have to have a middle ground, though, because it just goes back to the introduction. Snow days are great, up until a point, and then for many families it does become a burden or a hardship, and, and it's not always fun and game. So I think recognizing that there are a lot of different opinions out there is also important when trying to be a good communicator. But back six or seven years ago, the use of social media to let a little bit of personality shine through was, was a relatively new thing, and, and we, I, I think we took advantage of it and, and have tried to enjoy it ever since. Hi, my name is Coleman Jones, and my question is, did you ever suffer from stage fright, or did you, or if, and if you did, how did you overcome it? Ever suffer from stage fright, and if so, how, how did I overcome it? I don't immediately recall any, any crippling area of, of instance of stage fright, and, and I think that goes back to being prepared. I think being nervous, or being frightened about appearing in front of a group of people, at least for me, um, is, is mitigated or reduced if you're prepared. If you think about what you want to say, if you practice in front of a mirror, if you are just knowledgeable about your area of expertise, if you prepare, I think a lot of that nervousness goes away. So at least for me, being nervous or anxious or frightened in front of people happens when I feel like I haven't adequately prepared for something. If I don't know what I'm talking about or if I'm not sure what my audience is interested in, that's when stage fright or something similar to it seeps in. But if you put the effort in, if you do the work, if you are prepared and knowledgeable about your subject, it doesn't mean you know every answer or pretend you're the smartest guy in your room, because for me that's never the case. But if you just prepare, then I feel like a lot of that nervousness goes away. So I can't think of any specific example of stage fright only because I think I learned a long time ago from others I looked up to that preparation is really important. And that has stuck with me for a lot of years. Good question. Hi, my name's Maddie. Does your opinion go into the decision-making process of deciding if school's canceled or are you just the deliverer of information and whose point of view is heard when making that decision? Well, that depends. If you like the snow day decision, my opinion went into it 100%. <laughs> 
If you don't like it, I had nothing to do with it, and you got to blame the superintendent. No. Um, my opinion goes into it a little bit, but not in the way you might think. Ultimately, it's a decision of our superintendent, Dr. Cashwell, who I think a lot of you heard from a couple months ago at the first Fairfield Forum. Um, she's in touch with the other school system superintendents and also very closely in touch with what we call the operations department, the people who clear the schools of snow and ice, the people who drive the buses, the technology infrastructure to make sure we can have school on a given day. The things that go into making sure we can have school safely and on time are the opinions that matter the most to Dr. Cashwell in making that decision. Now, she might ask me, like, Andy, what do you think the reaction is going to be if we cancel or have a two-hour delay? And I might give her an opinion on that. And, and that probably plays a role, but ultimately, the things that matter the most when canceling school have to do with safety, and that's a collection of other people who give Dr. Cashwell some really good advice. We have people who, in our transportation department, will get in their cars at 4 o'clock in the morning and drive, not all of our bus routes, but many of them, and feed back some reports, take some pictures, like we got ice here, we got snow here, or it's just gonna be really bad in a couple of hours. And all that information comes into the superintendent who ultimately makes the decision. My job is to help her communicate it as quickly and as effectively as possible. My name is Kalani, and I would like to know what working in the public eye has done for your personal life. What working in the public eye has done for my personal life. It's, it's great. I, I really, really enjoy um, being able to represent a school system like Henrico County because it, it's so big, it's so diverse. There are so many interesting families and communities and, and being somewhat recognizable to not everyone, but at least a, a good portion of the, pers uh, of the community. Um, I hope I can help put a positive um, face on what we are trying to accomplish as, as a student community, as a, as a, a learning community, and as a county as a whole. Um, it, I don't think it, it, it's not something that adversely affects home or, or, or not. I, I like every once in a while when someone wants to take a picture or something like that, and I enjoy being able to represent what we do as an organization and what you accomplish as a, as a student body. And so maybe that's not for everybody, but I, I really enjoyed that aspect of, of this position. I think I'm very fortunate. Uh, you know, I may not be right, but I think it's one of the best possible gigs that you can possibly have, and not just in this organization, but in, in any organization, is to be able to reach out to our community and share some of the things that happen on the best days of students and teachers and families' lives. Being closely connected to that is really meaningful to me. And so whether it's at work or at home, being associated with that is, is a really meaningful thing. It also means that, and, and I think your teachers can relate to this too, is that you're never quite off. Meaning, I might be at work for a certain number of hours every day, but when I leave work, people still know I work for the school system. Much like people still know your teachers are teachers. And so you can be in the grocery store, or in the gym, or out to a restaurant some night. You just have to know that someone might be watching. Someone might recognize you and, and you just you want to act in a way that will represent your organization and your family and yourself appropriately no matter what time of day it is. It doesn't mean you can't have fun. It doesn't mean that you can't be yourself. It just means in the back of your mind you have to remember that everyone's got a camera. At some point somebody might see you doing something and you just have to be mindful of the idea that Make sure it's the best possible representation of yourself, of your family, and your community. Question? Hi, my name is Kiyari. Um, my question is, do you have any influence in school-wide decisions? If so, studies have shown that more breaks and outdoor activities throughout the day make a person more productive. Do you agree, and what would you do about it? So more breaks and outdoor time have a positive impact on productivity. I will tell you, I have a windowless office and I, the breaks are few and far between. So you're going to have to let me know how that is and I'll get back to you on that. I would really like to know what that's like. No. Um, I, I feel like I have input, but I'm one member of a large, larger team in a larger community. So 
When it comes to school-wide decisions, I don't think I have influence on all of them or even a majority of them. Every once in a while, I think my opinion is valued, but so are the opinions of eight or nine other people and even more depending on who the relevant audience is. Now, I'm involved in that snow day stuff and the cancellation stuff to be sure, but um, things that might inf impact or influence the day-to-day -day lives at school, I feel like I have very little to do with that. I might get involved if something unusual occurs. We talked about power outages, for example, and I might get involved in that. Um, but I, I always want to be prepared and be ready because I never, I never know when somebody might want my opinion on something. And so being prepared and knowledgeable for any sort of circumstance is important to me because I want to be ready for that situation should somebody want to know what I think. All right. We have about seven minutes left, so we can keep on moving. My, my name is Nakaya, and my question would be, what is the most important thing you do in Hawaii County Public Schools? If I heard that, what is the most important thing? I think the most important thing that I do or that we do as a communications team is that we do good things for other people. Like our job, one of many jobs that we have is to be there on some of the best days of a school's life, of a student's life, of a teacher's life, and help amplify that to a larger community to know that really good things are happening in Henrico County. And so having a, a front row seat to some of the best days in a, in a young person's life is really important to me and important to the team that we have back at the central office. And so doing good things for other people is really at the heart of what a good communications team can do. Because in a lot of respects, without us, without the platforms that we have, these good things would still happen, very much so. We're not responsible for making them happen, but what we can do is share them with a larger community so that your, your family, your friends, the people that you might know across town or the people in our 70 other schools might know that, hey, something really cool is happening here at Fairfield Middle School, like this forum. Like, we've got the platforms to be able to share this on, on the internet, on our social media platforms, and without that, yeah, some people might know that it exists, but it's also a big county, and other, our other schools, our 11 middle schools, are all doing other things right now. And so we can, we can take this, we can highlight it and bottle it up in a nice little video and, and share it with a, a larger community. And we do that over and over again, week after week, day after day, and that's really important to us. Taylor, and my question is, did you have any fears or anxieties during your time on NBC 12? Fears or anxieties? You know, I was, no reporter ever wants to get it wrong. So we work really hard to make sure we understand the facts of a story and that we've interviewed all the relevant people. Fear or anxiety comes from not doing the work in advance. You know, there's, the news is on at six o'clock or five o'clock or whenever it is, right? So I, going back to a point from earlier, the, the fear comes from not giving it your best effort. Like holding the microphone, getting ready for the news at six o'clock and just knowing that you could have interviewed one more person or you could have proofread your script one more time or fact check something important before showtime. And, and so I would always hope to minimize those fears and anxieties by double checking your work, having someone else look at your script or making sure that you've had that conversation with yourself about did I do my best on this assignment? You never have all day or all week to work on something. In life there are deadlines, meaning the news is going on at six o'clock whether you're ready for it or not. So your job is to manage your time and work through the team in such a way that you can get all these things done and feel comfortable and confident in your work prior to the deadline. And so I feel like those fears were minimized because as a professional, it was important to make sure that every day you're, you're giving your best effort in such a way that come showtime, you're fine. You, you've done everything you can do and you can have confidence when the news comes on. I'm wondering, how did you adjust your messages to fit the different audiences that you are speaking to? How would I adjust the messages to, to kind of fit the different audiences? Um, you know, it, it, that's a really important and good question to anyone who's in communications or public relations, which is to understand that it's a big county and people receive information in different ways. Your message should often be consistent and the same 
but not everyone has the patience or time for a 1,000 word email, right? So sometimes you have to take that big long email, which some people will read, but not everyone's gonna read, and how do you break that down into smaller digestible chunks? And so video is often good for that. Social media posts and graphics are often good with that. Or a long-term sustainable communication plan where you take that thousand word email and once, <clears throat> once a day for 14 straight days, you post a sentence or two about it. <clears throat> I'm getting choked up, I guess I'm emotional on this topic or something, but it, it's understanding that the audience is broad and diverse and <clears throat> I have like two bottles of water and a lot of guys are doing me right over there. Um, but knowing that in advance and planning for it is a really important thing about what communicators do. And it's not enough just to do one big long email and consider your job done. You also want to think about translating that email into Spanish and other languages that our community speaks. And realizing that you might get an email on Monday afternoon but what happens when I care about that issue two weeks from now? Where can I find that information? Is it on your website? And if so, is it in, on our website in a place where people can actually find it? And all of these conversations go into a multitude of different topics, and, and that, that can drive you crazy sometimes as a communicator, because something's important right now today, but you also want to take into account that it might be important to people weeks from now, and how do they find that information? And Is it up to date, and is it presented in such a way that people can understand and will answer their questions in advance. And, and that's, a, that's a big part of what we, what we do every single day. My name's Gavin, and my question is, what advice would you give to any students wanting to go into the field of work? What advice would I give to students who, what's the last part of that? Want to go into your field of work. Want to go into this field of work? Um, I think the advice holds true not only for communications as it might for, for a lot of different fields, but you know, listening and learning from others is as important as, as talking and being heard. And, and so I think effective communication is as much about what you don't say as it is about what you do say. Meaning, I'll be better at my job or my position and someone who wants to do this will be better at it in the future if you're listening to your audience as much as you're communicating to that audience and maybe a better way to think of that is you're always communicating with a group not to a group I'm not just dictating and then I walk off stage and then we're done in this for example there's questions and answers and in any walk of life I think you have to understand that when you're sharing information you're going to be getting something back from your audience and so doing a good job of that means that what you don't say is almost if not as important as what you do say because listening to other people will influence your ability to be a better communicator as you move forward. Got time for about two more questions. Hello, my name is Joseph and did you ever expect to be where you are today and if so why did you want and if not, how did you get to where you are? Yeah, I, um, I think it's fair to say I didn't expect like being, enjoying my work with the school system so much was something that would have occurred to me 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, I was in local news. I was going to do what a lot of people do, which is, you know, you start in a small town, which is what I did. I, I, my first job was in the town where I grew up, which was fun. And I was there for a lot of years. Um, and then moved into the Richmond market after about six years. And... It's very often the case that people move around every two or three years from city to city, and as you gain experience and, and um, get a little bit older, you know, you, you work your way up into larger markets. But you know, life happens along the way. You get married, you have children, and, and priorities change. And at least for me, like the idea of moving to bigger cities was probably something we could have done. But working weekends and holidays just to say I work in like Charlotte, North Carolina or Atlanta, Georgia wasn't as appealing to me as it used to be. And plus, we really like it here. And our, you know, our kids are growing up here. Our oldest is only in, in fourth grade right now. But, you know, there was that to consider as well. And, and being in Henrico County and Central Virginia as a whole um, is really enjoyable to us. And so 20 years ago, that might not have been a thing we were thinking about. But as we got older, it was like, this is, this is kind of the place where we want to be. And, and 
Um, so maybe 10 years ago, that makes sense. But no, I always thought I was going to follow the, the local news path, wherever that may have taken me. But I've found that being part of a school system is, is really a good fit for kind of like my DNA, like being part of the school environment uh, during the day like this or, or in, in the evenings with, you know, what, whatever my family has going on is a really solid fit for who I am and, and for what my wife and I enjoy. And that, a, a while ago, I, I would say that was kind of surprising. Now it, it feels quite natural. My name is Abby, and my question is, how did it feel to become a very known person in Henrico, and how do you think it happened? How does it feel to become a, a very known person? Um, well, I, I think there's some nuance to that. I think if I walk around in a school in a suit, I'm, I'm known. I, I can still walk around in a grocery store with a hat on and do okay. Like, there, there's not a... Thankfully, there's... A, you know, I think there's some limitations to who might know what I do. But in general, I, I, I think it goes back to an answer from earlier, which is I, I've taken a, a liking to being able to be associated with all the positive things that our school system accomplishes. It doesn't mean I'm responsible for them or I can take credit for them, but if in some small way I can be connected to what is happening here and what is happening in 71 other schools, I like being associated with that very much. And if I can use that attention or um, being noticed in that way, so to speak, if I can use that to redirect attention to what is happening here, or man, you should really pay attention to Fairfield because it's not just me, it's this. Um, you know, That's something I, I really try to do, is to try to use the platforms that I have to not just say, hey, like, yeah, look at me, I'm Andy Jenks, isn't that great? I, I, I really never try to give off that vibe. I try to use it to shine a positive light or redirect that attention onto what we all do every day in the first place, which is great. You might know who I am and what I do because we have a little bit of fun during the winter time, but there are 360 other days in the calendar where people are really working hard and doing some amazing things, and we're gonna move heaven and earth to try and tell those stories even when it's not snowing. And so being closely connected to that has been really meaningful to me, and, and if that means you know I take a few selfies along the way because I'm somehow connected to it, I think that's great. But I really want to use that attention to make sure on a daily basis the, the positive energy is being shared where I think it needs to be shared or reflected, and that's, and that's on our schools and the people who are in them every day. Wonderful. I think we're, we're kind of at the end of our time here. I'm sorry. Um, so, Mr. Jenks, thank you so, so much for those answers. And your last answer was especially humble. Um, we, want, we posed this to Dr. Cashwell before she left the first time. We want to ask you again. Uh, same question. Uh, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, used to uh, pose this, uh, this question. Uh, let's take a moment to thank and think of the people who loved us into being who we are today. So is there anybody who you'd like to tell us um, loved you into being who you are today and give this opportunity to thank those people? Well, this is going to be on the internet, right? So I have to thank mom and dad, don't I? They're eventually, no. Uh, even if it wasn't, I, I think a lot of people would share that their experiences are, are molded or shaped very early on in life. And, and so my mom was a teacher. I, I feel like I you know, relate very closely to the school environment, whether I know it or not, I guess, because of those experiences um, and, and just knowing what it takes to be a teacher and to stand up in front of a classroom all day, every day was uh, made a positive impression on me. Um, I, I think my, my mom and dad always wanted to make sure I was a positive reflection of, of myself and of them and our family as a whole. And so I think a lesson like that was meaningful to me. It doesn't mean I always got it right or it doesn't mean I didn't screw up as a kid. But I think now that I'm older, um, making sure you're representing yourself, your family, the people around you to the best possible ability is, is something I try to do every day. And, and I think that formed very young. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Guys. Let's give a huge round of applause for our forum speaker, Mr. Andy Jenks. Kaya, I believe you have a gift. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And uh, before we let you go, Mr. Jenks, we want to invite you and we want you guys to stay posted. April the 24th, former NFL wide receiver and Henrico High standout Billy McMullen will be our final forum guest. We think our final forum guest of the year. 
you're of course invited to that, Mr. Jenks. Uh, guys, thank you all so much. The audience, you guys are absolutely wonderful teachers at this time. We can begin to dismiss back to our classrooms. Thank you, everybody.